Good evening. <laughs> well, but here it's good morning. Morning. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to, to present you uh, Professor Uwe Keller from the University of Aveiro from Portugal. And today he will speak about the inversion of the noisy Radon transform and wavelet in Gabor frames on S3. So please, Uwe, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Please. Okay. Start. Just a moment. So, thank you very much for the invitation, and I hope it will be interesting for all of you. Maybe more interesting for some than for others. In any case, if you have questions or anything, please tell me. The talk, as I said, as was said, is about the inversion of the noisy radon transform. And in fact, behind that one, you have a very practical problem, which is shown by this machine, and that is a crystal tomography. So basically, this machine is giving us, uh, well, the data. And the problem you can see in the following. Let me just switch to my iPad. Is just a moment. Is basically, you have a specimen, polycrystalline. I just put it here from the earth and so on. And what you're doing is basically you measure on the sphere by basically sending an emitter who sends its x-rays inside and passes over all the sphere. And you have a receptor. <coughs> These ones go inside and basically are getting diffracted. And you have a receptor who runs around and catches all the data. Or let's simply say you have data given on S2, which is all the rays who are going in, and you measure them all on S2, so that your data actually is given on a manifold S2 times S2. And these ones, the rays going in and diffracted, are linked by the so-called spherical Radon transform. So let me go back to the slides. Basically, you make the measurements, and what you get is such kind of figures called pole figures. Basically, each of them, of these nine ones, you have to see as an entire sphere, even if you just see half of the sphere, plus a ray for each one corresponds to one ray, which is sent at a certain specific direction. And you can imagine, in practice, what you have is literally hundreds of these spheres, depending on the number of rays you gain in and out. As I said, the link between both of them is given by the spherical Radon transform, which basically measures all, well, the rays in and out, and measures basically all the connections these two can have. So you integrate over all the rotations, which send one ray into another. So if X represents a fixed ray, Y represents a fixed ray, you integrate over all rotations, which map one ray into the other. This can, for instance, be written in different ways, as I write here. In particularly, you integrate over all the great circles on the tree sphere. This is basically, if you just see one rotation into other given by a, rot by a quaternion, then it's easy to, to see that each pure quaternion which maps, which rotates x into y, is basically an element on the great sphere. And then it's also easy to see that all the rotations which map one into the other corresponds to a great circle on the tree sphere. These pro integral pro properties of obviously as properties, 
I just mentioned here the main important ones for us, in particularly the real data satisfies the ultra hyperbolic equation. The regularity, as you would expect it from a Raden transform, is going one half up. So you map from L2 over basically S3. Spin tree is a group, but of course S3 is, a is one of the representations of the group, and S3 itself is also a group, one of the few spheres. And it goes up into sphere, into the, as we said, measurements, and it goes up by one half, and of course it's inside the kernel of the ultra hyperbolic equation. In particularly, you can also show that the norm is given by this on, on S2. You have here the operator minus two on the two sphere. So that's basically that operator plus one. And between these norms, it is an isometry up to a constant here, but you can always normalize it. And this also gives you an inversion formula, at least a formal inversion formula, which simply says, I take my data, I integrate over this two sphere with that oper operator, and that gives me the inversion. There are a lot more that can be said about that one. These kind of things are studied. You can look at the works, for instance, of Palamodov, but many others, including Helgason and so on, if you are interested. For us, the question actually is more from the practical side, which is basically that while that formula is quite nice, it has one problem. It's for practical purposes not really useful. So if you really want to do practically the inversion, that formula doesn't really help you that much. So we want to actually to solve it. In particular, one of the biggest problems you have in practice is there's, as you can see here in the background noise, the signal or the things, the functions you get are not really in H one half because they are not really you don't get really this pure signal but always some noise. And noise means basically that in fact of L2 to H1 half, your real mapping is between L2 and L2. Because you cannot assume anything more about the noise than it being in L2. So your data, and your data is given, you want to invert actually this transform, which we call the noisy gradient transform. So from L2 to N2, and the question is from the data how we can retrieve our function f, also called pole, or, well, the data is called pole figures, and this one is also called an orientation density function. But I don't want to go too much in the modulation of the problem, rather how we solve it. And to solve that one, basically what we are doing is we have to answer three questions. How we expand f, of course, we want to have somehow solve it, so we need the expansion of f how we compute or approximate the inverse, and how we treat the case of noisy data. Here we will follow an interesting Yeah, Basically, first, we will use a frame, spherical frame expansion. Not a basis expansion, like one would assume, but a spherical frame expansion. For the approximation of the inverse, we'll use an iterative approach, like it's usually in inverse problems, but of course it should be connected to our spherical frame expansion, so we are interested in an iterative approach which goes along with our spherical frame expansion, in particularly which allows us to take advantage of uh, certain uh, properties of the frame expansion, in particularly if you have a sparsity, which means if you know a priori that only a couple of these uh, coefficients are non-zero, that you preserve it in the algorithm. And then, of course, there's a question how we treat noisy data, and that will be done by regularization. So, of course, there's one question now. You could simply ask uh, what's actually a, a spherical frame expansion, or more likely, what is a frame expansion? I mean, anybody who would think about it would simply say, well, we map the tree sphere to the two sphere, the product of two two spheres on the two sphere, we have spherical harmonics. So why don't we actually, under the three sphere, we have the Wigner day function as an orthogonal system. So why not using that one? It is a completely valid question, and the the answer is quite simple. Let me, for the answer, actually go a little bit backwards, and then you see what actually the question is. If you go to our pole figures, you can observe a lot of here blue areas. And blue areas means that the data is zero. 
So you can actually see that in practice, due to the fact that we are actually measuring crystals and crystals have fixed directions where they ref make the diffraction and all our directions basically get almost nothing due to the symmetry of the crystals. That's also why you can basically, knowing the orientation density functions, knowing where it diffracts, you determine what kind of crystals are inside. That most, and that means basically that our data is in general sparse. Now, if you would approximate, for instance, one of these data on the sphere by spherical harmonics, you get a lot of zero data. And that you want to avoid. There are algorithms which are also implemented, which are based on spherical harmonics. They do work, but the main problem is they don't take any advantage of the fact that your data, in fact, is well localized. So you cannot simply, well, you would not like to actually integrate over functions which are have the support on the whole sphere, and you basically have to move around on them. So you would like to have functions which are much more localized, much better localized. But this leads us to the question of using expansions which are not exactly bases. And the answer to that one is basically something which in the mathematics is known for quite a while and being used also for quite a while, but it's still not so well known. Basically, a frame is a system usually overdetermined such that if you integrate, well, if you take the norms of the functions, then you can see that the inner products between f and the frame are equivalent to the norm of the function. So they, in a certain sense, preserve the norm. Let me actually switch over to my iPad. Let me just see. Then I can show you the most simplest one you have is actually called the Mercedes frame. And, but it's rather illustrative. So you basically, instead, in two dimensions, so I have here X, I have here Y, and of course you could just take X and Y. But you could also do something else. You could also just simply say, I take these vector and Y, but now I take here a vector and here a vector, and I expand my functions in three vectors. So I have here E1, E2, E3, and I simply say my vector F, V instead, I want to expand into three vectors. Obviously, one thing you will tell me immediately, they are not linearly independent, and basically the Vs, V1, V2, V3, are not uniquely determined. On the other hand, if I choose something, like for instance, a vector in this direction, then you can see that it would be much more advantageous to actually just decompose it with the sprigs with respect taking these and these angles, which are, of course, less than 120 degrees, of course. Well, actually, they are less than 90 degrees, and you always get small angles. So you never actually get into the risk that you actually work with large angles in that case, which usually represents numerically a problem. So you can actually simplify things a lot. And that's the idea behind the usage of these frames. Now let me switch again back. And just a moment, we are here. And how we can work with these frames well, there's one thing and one important result in frame theory that is the existence of a dual frame. So always when you have a system, a frame, there always exists a dual frame so that you can expand F in this form. Obviously, it means one thing. It means basically, if you look at here, that the frame and the dual frame create a biotonal system. So if you take the dual frame, it will always be orthogonal to the corresponding well, you will always have the inner or the bilinear form between psi i star, psi k will be zero if i, equal, I equals different to zero, uh, I, I equals different to k, and so on. The point behind here is that 
You can also see frame as a generalization of biotoggle basis, which is much nearer to the truth than saying that the frame is a generalization of a basis. It's much near to the things that you say, okay, if you're actually not interested in autogonal autog autog basis, but you would like to have biotoggle basis. And if you drop the co condition of that you want to have linear independence, you actually get biotoggle, well, frames, which are by construction always have a dual frame, so they always create biotoggle systems. The question, of course, is how we can work with them. And that basically you can, one can simply say, well, we always have a biotoggle frame, so I can always write it like this. And in practical terms is the only thing I know, I usually know or have from the measurements is that I know the inner product between F and Psi I. And for representing F in that form, I need to calculate the coefficients with respect to the biotoggle frame. This can be done rather naively by simply saying, okay, I take an operator which maps the biotor, well, the Fourier coefficients, let's say it like this, or frame coefficients, into my coefficient CI, which means that it's adjoint, obviously, picks up any kind of sequence and evaluates the sequence on the frame. <coughs> and if I want to solve it, basically it means that I would have to solve a system like this. So the a joint operator to C applies to F. Normally, that is done by just, well, they are now a large number of frame algorithms. The simplest idea would be basically just applying F on both sides, and then you would get here a kind of gram matrix to apply to the other side. But of course, while you can still, under certain conditions on the frame, prove that it is a symmetric and positive definite, Obviously, uh, it's also overdetermined, so while you can cut it and so on, and it behaves like this, it's not the best thing to do. Especially, it doesn't take any advantage that you actually have freedoms in the choice of the CIs. As I said, they are not uniquely defined, so you could simply impose conditions which makes them particularly interesting. For instance, one of the classic conditions will be that you request that the number of non-zero coefficients are to be minimized or say you, you want or as little coefi non-zero coefficients as possible in your calculation. So, but that leads us to the question, of course, how we construct frames on the sphere. Um, that basically puts us to the question how to construct frames in general. Well, for that one, let's take a look first to the frames in Rn. I think most of you are familiar with it. If not, uh, it's relatively fast explaining. You basically have the window Fourier transform where you have basically modulations and translations of a window function. And the standard idea to look at it is look at it from the point of view of representation theory and simply say, well, I basically can just take translations and dilations and I take a group representation which acts on the function uh, psi by modulating and dilating. Of course, modulating, dilating, this is uh, this action is done by the Weil Heisenberg algebra from the Weil Heisenberg group uh, in the end. So basically, what you have here is a representation of the reduced Weil Heisenberg group. We act on that, and then you basically can see the whole. Win for your window transform is nothing else that you integrate your function f against the representations with respect to a fixed function. So, in case you reduce it, for instance, to a to a well to a finite do domain and so on, or let's say the torus, then of course you know that your group becomes abelian and uh, commutative. Well, abelian and also rotational, so you basically just have them going over the discrete group of the torus, and then this bond here, for instance, which we switch from an integral then to a sum and so on. But for us, the only important thing is that we know, okay, for the construction, we take the corresponding group acting on the manifold, which is here as Rn, as a surf, well, as a flat space, 
and we construct the corresponding group. And the same idea we can use on the sphere. So on the sphere, what are we doing to do? Well, we take a signal on the sphere and you have to define the Fourier transform on that part. There are several ways to do that. There are probably a lot of you will simply say, wait a minute, the proper Fourier transform on the sphere is the expansion in terms of spherical harmonics. Nothing against that. But what the idea here is, we take the actions, we take the groups which work act transitively on the sphere. And for that one, we take translations and modulations. Translations on, on the tree sphere are simple, it's spin four. And that are all the rotations which act on it. And modulations, we actually, and here we are, in some sense, a little bit cheating because you could simply define the modulations as multiplications with spherical harmonics. That, of course, works. And you could actually create, and a lot of these directions go into the direction of so-called Parseval frames, where you then would go in the direction of what Isaac Pesenson and others are, are doing quite successfully. But here, I want to simplify the idea a little bit based on our problem. As you have seen before, our problem is well localized. So if you take the sphere, you actually have data only in rather small neighborhoods. Which means that you could actually do a small trick and simply say, wait a minute, if I localize the things, locally the sphere for me is flat. So, which means that I just take this, the Euclidean group and while I take the rotations with respect to spin 4, I just take classic flat trans modulations. So I just take a classic flat modulation, basically on the sphere, you just take it locally, consider it locally flat, and then you take that modulation. This gives us the following windowed Fourier transform, where you just simply say, okay, wait a minute, I now integrate against all these, I choose a proper, well-localized window function, and then I integrate against all these representations. I make all the representations I indicate against all of that. That would be basically the idea, and that would be the definition of our Fourier transform on the sphere or our Garbo transform on the sphere, the continuous one. Of course, there is a problem immediately. Does this, so such kind of size exist? Can we actually construct size who do that one? With other words, can we have admissible function for our group representation? Well, and the answer actually is no. Because you immediately say, whatever psi you use, it's not finite. Because frankly, there's one problem, especially if you go from the one dimensional case to the higher dimensional case, your groups become bigger. The possibilities of your group representations become bigger. And in general, the group is too large. That's basically the case here. Your group is too large and you cannot find any square integrable function for this kind of setting. So, what do we do if the group is too large? Well, basically, what one always does in such kind of cases, we simply have to reduce it, which means we have to factorize it. So, we choose a closed subgroup, H, and we consider the, fa uh, uh, the space by factorizing out H from the group. The only thing is, we consider that homogeneous manifold, it might be a group, does not need, can also be just a homogeneous manifold. There are some cases where there's a group and some cases not. We will later on go that one. The only thing was that we actually still want to have our G invariant measure D mu on the thing. And that can, in our case, for instance, be we just take the subgroups of the, of the translations where we'll factorize the last one. So 0, 0, P4. And if you factorize it, basically you throw away the last coefficient and you just have three the uh, coefficients for the transla for the translation and then you basically instead of using this part you just take the representation given by this part so you must basically go to the homogeneous space take a section you apply the section and then you actually take the group of this action of that section in psi it modifies the admissibility condition the classic one would be just that you say f of psi would be here a module, uh, just the identity operator applied to F. 
Here it means basically that we have to modify it that this action gives us an operator which is weakly singular a a psi sigma needs to be at most this weakly singular operator ideally it would be just a multiple of the identity that would be ideal but it can be a weakly singular operator only then later on one has to be a little bit more careful so if it's for uh, for you if you follow it just imagine a being just a multiple of the identity that's the easiest one just to follow the things and that should be happening for all of them and then the question is simply how we can fulfill that and there is a small trick behind that one which is basically that we actually can simply say that basically what i'm doing here is a rather simple trick you basically take your psi on the sphere you assume that it only has support in the upper half sphere of S3. And then you basically just take the vertical projection downwards. So you are only in the upper half sphere, or even if it's a tree sphere. You vertically project it down to R3, which means basically that, okay, outside, it, and then you extend it outside at zero. So take basically the tree sphere. Consider the equator, for instance, as the unit, well, the equator as a unit uh, sphere in R3, so S2, and then consider in the flat space, you extend it by zero in the flat way. That basically means that you now are actually on the plane, and you can use the standard for your transform, and use that visibility condition for that one, and that gives you exactly what I'm writing here where you simply say, okay, I take basically the last angle divided by cosinus of psi, psi here, and then I integrate just between 0 pi and 0 to pi. That's basically the standard one, and this part I will have here, and Q is just a projection. So, and that basically means that the, just like in the classical case, if you want a visibility condition, it basically just comes up when psi here is pi half there's basically where the singularity is and which we have to control. So, under these circumstances, we can then say, okay, the mapping with the square root of that visible, normalized by the square root of that visibly constant, as usual, is an isometry between spin four, uh, four times R3 and, well, S3 and spin four times R3. So, and it is an isometry, which means basically that you have these kind of parts. So if you take the transform of F and the norm, it corresponds to the norm on the tree sphere, on the tree sphere of the function Q. So this part is basically just the standard one. The only trick one has to keep in mind is exactly that part. We take the support of the window function in the upper half sphere, make the vertical projection, and that's basically all of the rest is just really writing it out and having, and then one can see that singularity in pi over two and the rest is actually fine. And that's basically how we do that. And if we do that, then you can also get a reconstruction formula immediately from the continuous one, which is the following. That's usually what you have in games of these transformations. If they are, if you have unitary transformations, so you can immediately write out the reconstruction formula. For us, there's only one problem. There's no description, discrete expansion formula. So what I would like to have is actually a discrete expansion formula for F, not just a continuous one. So that one is something we have to deal with it. And to show that, for instance, possible choices of the window function, I wrote one down here, you have here, but there are also others you can choose. The only thing I'm doing here with that window function to simplify it, I just take the first one and this one will be put just rotationally symmetric on the sphere. So if you just take a small neighborhood and then you move around and these function, window function, you just start, then move around the entire sphere. So, and if you write, you can actually write down the dual window but then you have just a finite linear combination of shifted windows for that one. But uh, the advantage you will later on see is we don't really need explicitly the dual, dual window. And that's also the biggest important thing in these frame algorithms 
every you have the theoretical result that there is a dual frame, but you don't want to use it. You want to work just with the frame and not just calculate the dual frame. That usually means that you already have the inversion, so there are easy algorithms for that. So, and that's basically the continuous one for that. In the same way, I can also do it for the wavelet transform. For the wavelet transform, it's basically exactly the same idea behind. If you look for the wavelets, basically you take the affine group or AX plus B group, depending on where you are, of the real line in the classic concept in R, where you simply say, okay, my group is really the affine group. A as a multiplication operator, of course, it's not, it's not included in zero and the translations are given by R. And then I take as a representation the usual one X minus B over A translated and dilated of my function A with a certain, well, normalizing factor. Of course, that representation is, is a continuous one and indeed a representation. So the action basically here you have, if you have the same action, is the same as a group action acting on A and B. And the wavelet transform is again catching an admissible or square integrable function and then integrating your function f against all of these. That's basically the idea behind that one. For the sphere, we use exactly the same idea. The only problem is exactly that uh, there is one problem, which one has to be a little bit careful here. First of all, if I look for, for uh, wavelets on the sphere, you will see a large literature, literally large, because basically it's one of the canonical domains. So you can imagine for the two sphere and so on, three sphere not so much, but for the two sphere and so on, there are lots and lots of constructions. Most of them are based on approximate identities. So, like for instance, you take spherical harmonics and then you just try to replicate by series of spherical harmonics the properties of, well, the approximate identity and so on. For instance, there are here, we are not going into that, also not into needlets or other things. We are just sticking to our things. We want wavelets based on group representations. And they are different constructions. One thing is, which is also linked to the approximate identities, you just take the heat kernel and then expand it, take the representations, take the heat kernel of the rep over the, the sphere, and then you write it down in terms of an orthonormal basis, using, of course, the fact that speed 4 is a compact group, so you have an orthogonal decomposition. For instance, one reference I gave here to the thesis of Sven Ebert, but there are also other works on that part. It also goes in the direction of Sven of eight the numbers. In case of the really group representations, there's a classic construction by using the Ibazawa decomposition on the group SO n plus 1, 1, or the spin group. Basically, there's just double covering of special orthogonal groups, so it's, I wouldn't actually make one difference there. Yeah, here, here is that you take this group, which is acting, which is basically nothing else in the Lorentz group acting on the sphere. The only thing is, as I will mention things, again, the group is too large and we need to decompose. And for decomposition, either you use the Ivasama decomposition and factorize the compact subgroup, or you take the Katan decomposition and factorize the compact. Both are possible, both lead to different works, and both are done. One is the classic work of Antoine van der Geins, the other one is done by Milton Ferreira, former PhD student. And that's basically what we discuss here. And we will discuss actually more the second one. So for that one, as I said, we have to use this group spin N1, and that's the conformal group of the ball, which means basically it represents all conformal transformations on the ball. You can take, so basically you can take the entire group, which is spin N1, and then you can decompose spin into spin one, that's a Cartan decomposition, spin one one, and spin n, also known as KAK decomposition. As I said before, 
if n is larger than or equal to 3, these representations of these groups in terms of translations and dilations are not square integrable. What you can see is, of course, the translations are given by spin, a, spin n acting on the sphere. So these are the translations. And the dilations basically are given by spin n, spin 1, 1. There's one way you can see the whole thing a little bit easier. This decomposition, which makes it a little bit e easier to, for you to understand. Spin n, of course, are all the rotations. But if I take a sphere, okay, then spin 1, 1 corresponds actually to the vertical axis. So let me actually just draw it in 2D because it's easier to see. Then spin 1, 1 corresponds to all the Möbius transformations you do on the sphere where the, where the parameter is running on the main axis and that creates orbits of the type, well, of course, the equator is, li is left, well, the equator is basically left invariant, but then you will have orbits of that type. So, so the decomposition given by our, by spin 1, 1, if you just take the main axis, is just orbits of this type. So you can actually imagine if you have, for instance, a function which is, has support on the upper half sphere, along, if you go along the sphere, you can actually enlarge or reduce that spherical cap. The support you can actually play around, just like in the classic case where you play around on the real line with the support. It's exactly this part. That spin one one doing spin n in the spin one one spin n factorization actually makes a small thing. So if I have a spherical cap, if you have a spherical cap here, then spin n leaves the as a Möbius transformation leaves the spherical cap invariant, but it moves that point, for instance, here, and all the lines which go like this are now remapped into lines like this. So, so basically what that thing is doing is a dilation inside a spherical cap. That's basically what spin n is doing as a Möbius transformation here. Otherwise it acts as a rotation and this one here as I wrote it is just spin 1-1. One, one. So it also has an effect in practical terms independent of the things. And let's let me now go back to my text. So I'm just going there. Basically, you have several ways uh, you compose it. What for us here will be interesting is basically spin n times spin 1, 1. That leads us to wavelet analysis, spin n times spin 1, 1 will give us the dilation on the sphere. You could also just factorize the first one and use spin 1, spin n. That is usually what in the literature is when you look for functions here in the unit ball. So if you actually you look the unit ball, in R4 and what the function theory for it, then this one is actually what is basically used for it. Mostly you will find spin 1 times spin n called as the group of Möbius transformations. That's actually one of the things which is usually written. The point is it's actually not true. It's not actually, a, it does not form a group, but it's usually called a group. So usually persons will say, it, Talk, talking about the group of Möbius transformation, they will also sometimes say group of Möbius transformations up to rotations, pointing out that if you would join the rotations, of course, then you have the entire group, and that is indeed a group. But uh, there is a certain ambiguity in the literature. The other way you could see it simply saying, okay, it is a homogeneous space, and I don't want more than that. You could also go for by that one. The more interesting part is, is actually almost a group. It doesn't form a group itself, but it's almost a group. And something which in the literature, well, nowadays in the literature is called a gyro group. 
And the Jairo group basically has these definitions. So you basically take a group. It's basically almost a group. The only thing you have is for the associ associative law, you simply actually ask not that A plus B equals the, uh, well, A in parentheses B, C is A, B parentheses C, but that there's a so-called gyration acting on C, and that is basically from an automorphism group which acts on the group itself. So you request that there's additionally to the, to the group as a manifold, it also has an automorphism group in itself. And the associative law is, the rest is exactly the same as in the classic one. And possible examples of these groups are, for instance, these groups of a mirror's transformation of the unit, Paul in R3, for instance, or in Rn. You could do that one, so the group of various transformations with the rotations and so on. Others are in relativity, Einstein addition, and other things. They are usually correspond to these kind of things. And we are actually working with a gyro group that gives us a much better structure than we actually have before. So, look in our, in our case, things become actually much more easier to see if you want. Basically, you consider the Möbius transformation in R3. If that one looks a little bit strange to, to you, I wrote it in the language of Clifford algebras to uh, simplify my thing. Basically, you could see this one basically just as a Kelvin inverse and you just multiply it with the Kelvin inverse of your function. You can also write it like classically, like in the books of Arnold, uh, Arnold or Alphos, directly in a real way. So you can also write it just as a real Möbius transformation. There are several ways to write it. I just wanted to have a short one. So see this one basically just as a Möbius transformation. And the multiplication is just multiplication with the Kelvin inverse up to a minus sign for this part. Then the representation will be exactly that. You take your function, you rotate it, and you'd make a Möbius transformation with respect to the, the parameter phi a, a uh, factorized parameter, and you just multiply it with a factor which is only to make it unitary. So that factor is basically there just to make it unitary, but this will be our representation. And if you use that one, then you can immediately recognize that the representation, you basically have an, uh, now an integral transform which maps the fear into our gyro group by means of that representation. So I just take my function, I integrate against all representations, and I integrate over this, this fear. So, it's just like in the standard case of the continuous wavelet transform. So, of course, there is one question. If there's admissibility, and for the admissibility, you basically write down the admissibility condition like we had it in before. The only thing to get conditions, moral conditions, you just apply the Fourier, Fourier transform on the sphere. In this case, it's just really just using expansion in spherical harmonics. And then you actually have the condition for the Fourier coefficients such that this one is happening and you have an invertible operator in the sense that this one actually corresponds to an operator of that type where A here is a weakly singular operator. So that one. This is just like in the classic case. In the classic case, you would have exactly the same thing. If you write down, on the real line, for instance, if you write down the whole thing in terms of the admissibility condition for groups, and then you take the Fourier transform over it, then it's exactly the classic admissibility condition you find in every book on wavelets. It's just that. You take the admissibility condition or the square integrability condition for group, for representation of groups, and then you just Fourier transform the whole thing and that exactly gives you that admissibility condition everybody is using. So it's nothing else, it's just part of the theory, only just written in a different way. So, and the same thing is here. To show it, we just take an expansion and then we just show that the Fourier coefficients have to co behave like this. Okay, again, because of this, you have immediately a reconstruction formula that's basically by construction. But again, you have uh, 
a problem a priori this is not a discrete one there's a continuous one so there's no discrete expansion formula on the other hand there's a small trick you can use for creating admissible wavelets you could just use a similar trick to what i mentioned in the case of the gamma transforms you take just an admissible wavelet let's say rotational variant or if you want on r tree and then use the KD transform to map it on the sphere. It basically corresponds to say, okay, I take a wavelet in, in R tree and I take stereographic projection to the sphere, and that should give me an admissible wavelet on the sphere. That's basically a construction how you can lift wavelets from R tree to the sphere. It's not 100% kosher, but it basically, in most of the cases, works. So, now, as I said, the problem is we don't have a discrete expansion formula. So, while we have here continuous transforms in both cases, in the continuous and in the, well, in the GABO case and the wavelet case, we don't have a discrete expansion formula. And the question is how we can construct that part. And basically, behind this one is a trick which is uh, probably not so well known. I mean, it's well known in the cases where persons are working with representation theory, but usually it's not so well known. This correspondence principle, which basically tells you, if I have a representation, I take my integral transform. Let me actually write it a little bit in an easier way so that you can actually get it in a little bit simpler way because I don't want to actually have Let's simply say I have just the representation of group and then of course my integral transform is just given by taking all the function representations with the function g. In particularly, it means that I can also use instead of f another representation of my parts. And if I do that one, I basically get this V psi pi h of psi. Admissibility basically means that if I plug in both psi, I get it. And this one basically gives me now a function, which is, let me write it like this, phi of psi pi h of psi. And this one I can write as a kernel, which is G and H. Now, if I assume that, for instance, V psi maps L2 over my uh, space into L2 over my group, then this RGK is a reproducing kernel. in L2 over G. It's not, it doesn't reproduce the entire L2, but it's a reproducing kernel. So I can look at the reproducing spaces of that. In particularly, I can look, okay, a new space M, which I call M2, which are basically, I take F in L2 over G, such that that reproducing kernel uh, just a moment. This part basically applied to F is giving me again F of G. So I can look at the space of all functions which are reproducing. Strictly speaking, I can also use it to so to uh, create so-called uh, well to create also scale spaces. For instance. In particularly, I could do the same thing for LP, and then I could ask, what are these spaces? Strictly spaces, these spaces are called orbit spaces. And that's basically what I'm saying there. Basically, these spaces, you can also do it for LP, just simply take instead of L2, LP. So you can actually create spaces LP, and they are called orbit spaces. And then I could just take the inverse transform, so basically ask for the functions m2, 
which are basically all the f such that v psi f belongs to m2 and these are the so-called co-orbit spaces. In the classic case, these are well known. If you have a group, if G is a group and you have a, for a group, a rep reproducing kernel, you can always show that these M spaces here, which I wrote, these co-orbit spaces will be classical spaces. For instance, if you take the, the uh, if you take the, in the case of the wavelet transform, the classic wavelet transform, you get basically Bezov spaces. And also for a group, at the moment where you have group representations, these spaces always correspond to classic spaces. It's not the case for gyro groups or if you actually use as your original manifold, not a, well, as your group, have a, a homogeneous manifold. Then of course, because there you have freedom. I mean, you can always play around with homogeneous manifolds and so on. So you can actually create spaces which have different weights and so on. But in the case that you have a square integrability over a group and you use that one for your integral transforms, these M's will be always classically known spaces. So, and of course there are discussions about what it is. Now, let me go back for the case we are actually discussing here. So as I said, we have a correspondence principle. I just take here the Euclidean group, for instance, the first case, modulo my subgroup and my section, and an admissible pair, which also depends on that part. And then I can show that this bijection between L2 and this reproducing kernel space you have here. Classic assumptions is of course, and the classic assumption to construct frames is now that this reproducing kernel is absolutely integrable over, the, over the, the group. So if you take the integral with respect modulus of the kernel with respect to d mu, it has to be finite with respect to g and with respect to l, depending on your integrate over g or l. The second one is that the representation is irreducible, and as I said, with these ones you can create actually so-called co-orbit spaces. So. Maybe the most famous ones of the core orbit spaces are the modulation spaces of Kröchnik and Feichtinger. So, and to create GABA frames in our case, we need now something which is, uh, well, which actually does exactly, which in some sense, use these R's and discretize them. And for that one, let me actually just go for a moment back to my, uh, to my iPad so that you can actually see it. Uh, no, this time it's not actually jumping. But uh, let me actually just. So wait a moment. I'm just switching back to my iPad. So for the discre for the discretization now, basically you can imagine our space, this part, and you need now something which covers the, the whole thing. So basically what we need is a set of points such that with their neighborhoods, they cover the entire, well, they cover the entire group or a homogeneous space, or in our case, in the case of frames, it's a gyro group. And the point is basically what you will need is that these coverings here are, let me say, not too big and not too small. If they are too small, you don't have reconstruction. If they are too big, you don't have stability when you actually go for the numerical algorithm. So you need actually a, a covering which is overlapping with respect to a certain level and you cannot be too big or too small. I mean, if you're too big, if you if they basically, for instance, between two points of that neighborhood hits the other point, of course, it's obvious you don't have stability because you can't really distinguish between the points. While when they are too small, you might leave things out and you don't have reconstruction. So now let me go back. And that's basically now to our slides and to measure these things 
I take the oscillation kernel. Just ignore everything. See it just these parts here, basically just for the representation of psi. You take psi against the representation. And the important thing is actually that you make a certain, well, you take a certain neighborhood and you take all the changes in the representation with respect to that neighborhood. So U dense and the relatively separated means basically that the family you take in your uh, gyro group or homogeneous space, you just take them such that if you take U around as a neighborhood around each point, they cover everything. And the oscillation kernels basically, you take the two things and then you just take the deviations you have between that one. Basically, what that thing measures is in the case of uh, in the case of Garbo frames where you have these oscillations or these modulations, it basically measures how much that function is variating in the neighborhood. And if you do that one, then you can get an estimate, which I just write, where you just plug it in over the upper. In the case of Garbo, you just get over the upper half space here because we just assume that it's only dense in the upper half sphere and you just write it down in that form. Together, then you estimate the whole thing and you get the following theorem. If the integral over the oscillation respect to your measure over the space can be estimated by a constant, one over the admissibility constant, and the constant needs to be smaller than one. You can get bigger than one, but then it's basically just you get something where you can simply, but not really a frame in our case, because then you cannot really fix the parts. So you want that this constant is basically less than one over the admissibility constant. And then the set you're constructing in that way will always be a frame. This means that basically you can, if F is in L2, this one will be in small L2 and there are constants such that we actually set beforehand. The norm of these, all our Fourier coefficients, or the sequence of our Fourier coefficients will be an equivalent norm to the other thing. And of course, you have this in synthesis operator, so you have a frame operator and a joint frame operator, and if you just program them together, you can basically just build your function back from it. So that is one of the things we can do. The same thing you can do in the wavelet case, almost. And that's the point. I wrote here the reproducing kernel for the gen for general psi. That's basically what you get if you just write it down for a general psi and move all the things over to one side. So that is your reproducing kernel with respect to your rotation and dilation parameter. I just use spin one one here, so just to, to simplify, that's why you have in the end here. And there's one problem with that one. One of the conditions we had in this in the classic wavelet in the classic uh, theory of of these co-orbit spaces and this frame theory that you want L1 integrability over this one. And that's difficult to achieve. Actually, we don't know any example of a psi for which actually the whole thing is L1 integrable. And we don't have a proof that it cannot be done, but we don't know any example where that one is possible. So, and to overcome this one, there's a nice trick lately which is instead of using L1 integrability, I mean, you just have to think about why do one needs L1 integrability here? Well, of course, because you can use air as covering the things, etc., for your things. And you, what you want, what L1 integrability gives you, L1 is a, convolu is a convolution algebra. So that's basically for the reproducing kernel when you just move the things around in the proofs, what is important. And here, the way out is a trick which was used as, uh, uh, well, lately, or introduced lately, I don't know if it's known earlier, that you take the intersection of all the previous LP spaces. You take all LP spaces, take the intersection of all of them. Then one of the things which is interesting is that that set, or that space, the intersection of these spaces, is still closed under convolution, which means you can use them. On the other hand, you get an epsilon against L1 integrability, and that epsilon is decisive. So while you cannot prove that this one is an L1, you can prove that 
if I take the norms with respect to P larger than one, then it's integrable with respect to all these LP norms, where P is larger than one. So you can use this one, and then you can basically move on and use also these ones in the case of the wavelets. So then you can also do exactly the same thing here. And that's exactly the same thing you can actually do also in the case of the wavelets with that trick. And you can now continue and build wavelet frame space. The theorem is basically the same thing now, only that, of course, the condition is changed to the intersection of these L1 spaces. So that's basically the, the thing. In the theorem itself, you don't see it. It's really in the proof. So, and now, how to construct a, a wavelet frame? Well, a dilation you can construct always, uh, as I said, spin one one you can all is the vertical axis in the S3. So you can just use it, use that one, dilate it with respect to a hyperbolic lattice of that part. So you just take a hyperbolic lattice. For the lattice of spin four, basically for, this, for the uh, Gabors, I didn't wrote it before because it will come in the end. You can always use uh, a fixed uh, lattice, uniform lattice like the 600 cell or so. Now, if you want to have a finer scale, you can use a subdivision scheme, like for instance, the one of Navratil and Potman for spin four to S3, which gives you a quasi uniform in, uh, distribution. It will get worse the finer and finer you go, but it will always give you for any level a quasi uniform distribution. And you take a function like, for instance, this one, which is radially uh, symmetric. And then you can basically build F, for instance, F can be approximated by this and so on. And then you can just work this one as your admissible function and take a radial one and so on. So now coming back to our problem, our motivation problem, how we actually can now integrate or how we can now inverse our integral transform. As I said, it's a radio transform, so it's moving by degree one half. So RF belongs to the smooth, smoothness space. It doesn't help us because RF is basically, you had all, have always some noise. You can also assume that the data is actually in L2. So you will, the smoothness doesn't help you anything. But you can assume that F has a sparse expansion. The point is basically that behind that one, of course, is a symmetry of the let, of the of the group of the crystallographic groups for your crystals. And there's an interesting thing that while well, you have in large number, well, if I had number of point groups, space groups, so things which are invariant under translation and uh, rotations, fixed rotations, there are only 32 of them. And that will help us that we can afterwards actually argue that indeed we have a sparse, we can assume a sparse expansion. So we can use sparsity preserving algorithms here. And that's basically what we're actually doing there, because our op we can now recast this optimization problem. Your co unknown coefficients, your frame operator applied to them, the rate transform of them minus the data, and you want to minimize that one, where you take the to force enforce the sparsity, you can take C from a ball of radius of a fixed radius, and you impose that whatever you take is in L2, but the L1 norm needs to be small. And the L1 norm is basically which pushes everything down. So you don't take the L2 norm, you just project on an L1 ball and you minimize that one. And that actually creates as at least approximative sparse algorithm. So, and the minimization, and basically that means you get this kind of iteration. This is basically a kind of, I mean, if you look at it, it's like kind of classic Landweber with only that one, the PK here is a projection to the L1 ball. So you get your things on the L2, you project the L1 ball, and then you know that exactly the points, well, in two spheres, where the projection is not working are exactly the points where the, where the signal would be sparse. So in one of the axes where one of the coefficients is zero, or the planes where several of them are zero. Good. Now, the algorithm I wrote down here as an example, etc. If somebody is interested, one can simply take that one a little bit more to the details. For the numerical simulation, I just gave here the Gabor frames. So you take a simple analyzing act, 
atom that's basically one special case of our previously mentioned admissible functions for the frame grid for the frequency we just take the usual z3 for the rotations i take the 120 vertices of 600 cell this is not chosen by uh, by chance because as i said of the 32 space groups 17 are subgroups of 600 cell or let's say for all the crystals you have inside which are whose uh, symmetries are represented by one of the 70s space groups you can assume sparsity here i will just use the uh, synthetic or academic examples with that part that will just give you of an of an orientation density function basically think of it that you actually just have it concentrated on all the axes and for outside is, is zero and i just consider three cases we have no noise five percent noise and ten percent noise and then the org this is the original for configuration of the pole figures i'm not giving it on the tree sphere because that's a little bit difficult to uh to see or to uh, visualize so basically I, I give you the pole figure for the original ones and then i give you the pole figures for the reconstructed ones this one would be the reconstruction without noise you have the noise data the discrepancy this is the sparsity against the discrepancy and basically here are the atoms he's actually catching all the other coefficients you can see here are zero he's just he just needs to catch the ones the first ones and the rest is actually all zero so that's basically really reducing a lot by the algorithm just to non-zero coefficients and you see the result here that's without noise almost perfect and then the five percent noise you can actually see he almost has it and the discrepancy with respect to sparsity when the algorithm runs is here the rest doesn't actually say so much and uh, this you wait you can simply see now that's a reconstruction with 5% error and the same thing with 10% error. He gets, I mean, he, it's hard to see here, but he gets a couple of more, uh, more coefficients here, which he catches and a couple of them are also down here. So they are not actually all zero. They are just really rather small, but in the majority is down here. They're all the majority here basically later on is all zero and you have the whole thing done and this is basically the relative error and so on so you can basically just to give you an idea that's how it looks like with 10 percent error compared to here the the original one that's the original one and then you can simply see that's without noise that's a five percent error and that's with 10 percent error so and that's basically what i would like to to say about this part here and I hope it was interesting. In any case, if you have questions, etc., I'm more than willing to discuss the things and also to talk about it or, and also later on. So if somebody also has right now questions, feel free to ask them later on. I'm always available. So thank you very thank much you for very your attention. Thank you very much, It was very interesting. Thank you. And such a panoramic view of this uh, very important field and impressive result in, in the end. Thank you. Probably there are questions. May I have one question? Sure. May, may I have one question? Sure. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So, Uwe, thank you for your very nice talk. It's a very beautiful subject. Uh, I may have very naive question. Uh, you you said that you don't have a discrete um, decomposition, but you you, you you have some you have, you have some type of uh, parasival, maybe not inequality, maybe not equality, but some similar relation that you can uh, to to each function you can um, assign a sequence. Um, from L2, and then you can recover uh, a function from this sequence, right? By some some special operator. Yeah, well, the point is basically I have isometry between when I take all the representations, I have isometry between the two uh, spaces. 
Yeah. But there is a problem with the group and with the representation of the groups. The groups I have here, they are non compact and non abelian. And that means I lose one of the nicest results you have in the classic group theory for compact groups, which is the theorem of Peter Weil. Because Peter Weil basically gives you that you always have an orthogonal decomposition. So, for instance, if you take just, let's say, you just take the Fourier transform on a cylinder, then you automatically have your Fourier series as, which are the representation of the groups, you have your characters and they are discrete and everything. But for instance, if you go to the continuous one over the whole, whole real line, then you know that actually that is only locally compact and you have a continuous transform. So, and that one you have to discretize. And I have the same problem here. My representations give me only a continuous number of representation, not a discrete one. So the, all these rep, uh, integral transforms I'm constructing, they're all continuous, they are all isometries, but they are not discrete. So to discretize it, I have to use an additional method. So I can try to find some basis. I can also simply try to take a set and try to uh, try Gram Schmidt or something like this, but then it destroys all the structure. Or I try what I did try here, that I say, okay, I don't want exactly to have a basis. I want to have a system which can be overdetermined, in general will be overdetermined, but which still covers the whole space, and this are basically what I did with the frame construction. So, from the theory, you have a continuous transform, because you have a continuous number of representations, and then you basically say, okay, I want to discretize them in the sense that I want to take from them a, let's say, discrete set, which at closest approximates my continuous one possible, and that basically is an overdetermined set, and I construct a frame. Well, well, thank you, thank you, and you you have one to one connection, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Other question. Uh. Vlad, you, you, uh, your, your microphone is off. Can you shut on your microphone? Okay. What is relation your result to the result of the on the time frequency analysis of the group of the Grochening and group on Italian peoples uh, uh, con uh, Luigi Rodina and, uh, and uh, other one? Okay. Well, basically, I'm looking here at the case of the sphere, which unfortunately makes the things a little bit more complicated. I mean, I would like to have a similar theory, like for instance, you have for the time frequency analysis. But the time frequency analysis, you have one advantage. You have basically your translation and uh, modulations come from the Heisenberg group, and you have these rather nice representations which is something which is unique for the time frequency analysis. I mean, you don't have that much structure, for instance, wavelets, you don't have that much structure as in time frequency analysis, because there are two things. One thing is you have this Heisenberg group, and then via the parkman fock representation, you have the connection of the Fox space in the plane, where you basically make a link between your time frequency representations and analytic spaces, analytic functions in the entire plane. So they have an advantage in the sense that they have a link to a theory which is extremely rich and can be used for that. I don't have that. I would like to have that, or at least I don't see it right now. But ideally it would be simply that, like in their case, my, uh, my reproducing kernel, like in their case, I could make the link with the, like they have, for instance, with the Bachmann transform. That's basically exactly when you actually just map over the reproducing kernel. And that's basically uh, what I don't have here, what I would like to have. Because then things, the samplings and so on become much easier. Because I don't have a sampling theorem here, for instance. So, 
I mean, that's one of the things I would like to have. But for that one, there's also another problem behind that one, which is also something we are looking at, is the question for the sampling, is a question we are using reproducing kernels, and there are also a lot of results by now by other persons, especially also the questioning group looks at that part. You can extend this classic sampling to compact, op, uh, compact well, groups, compact groups basically. But that works because you take the compact group, you know that you have an elliptic operator on that one, let's say Laplace operator, Laplace Beltrami or what you say, and that means you have a decomposition into eigenfunctions. Now, I can do the same thing here, but the eigenfunctions reduce me again to the Wigner D functions. And what I would like to have is a sampling theorem based on the reproducing kernels I have here. And that is something which I'm currently looking at, and other, also other persons are uh, looking at that part. Can one have a sampling theorem based on reproducing kernels with respect to the with respect to, let's say, a non-compact group. And that's basically something which is, there is that, lately there was a, th uh, a paper by Gröchnik, Für, uh, Jaime, and some, some other persons, where they actually have a sampling theorem for, for reproducing kernels, only that the condition they're actually imposing is that you actually take balls and you take out balls with a distance a little bit smaller and you let that one go to infinity and you want that that one disappears. But the problem is if you look at the condition they have for that grow condition, that really means that your volumes have to blow up, well, blow up, let's say, increase polynomially with respect to the radius. And that's something typically for Euclidean geometry. For instance, here you have hyperbolic geometry. It's not happening because we all know they actually all grow with, uh, with respect to cosine hyperbolic of the radius, and that's never going to happen. That a condition like they have is fulfilled there. So it's still looking a little bit for the right tool to to handle this one. But the idea would be ideally think would be, and that would be really the link with the entire. Uh, feichtinger gröchnik theory would be if I could actually get a sampling theory for the reproducing kernel. And that's basically also what is under con construction there. That's Thank what it is. Okay, probably some other question or remark. Not, uh, thank you very, very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much so, again. Thank you very so much for thank listening. You. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope to see you all of you in two weeks. There will be announcement by mail. Of course, of course. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, you for a very nice talk. Thank, thank you. you for all to join us. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.